Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm here to tell you about uh, the query rewrite uh, for linear interfaces. And actually, uh, there are several interfaces, uh, as most of you uh, probably already know. Um, my name is Martin Hassan. I'm an optimizer developer at Oracle. Um, you can reach me at this email address. Um, here's my agenda for today. Um, uh, first, before I start, I'd like to, to take a little survey here. Um, first of all, uh, how many of you uh, were, were looking at uh, Stefa's presentation? Ah, oh, not, not that many at all. Um, how many paid attention? <laughs> ah, that, yeah, okay, that's good. Because um, you guys would notice that uh, this presentation is uh, pretty much covering almost the exact same thing that she was covering. Um, but she did the advanced stuff, and I explained the simple stuff. So, if, if she explained calculus, I'm going to explain multiplication to you. So, it's, it's a little out of order. Um, but first I'd like to ask you, has, has anybody of you used plugins? I mean, installing plugins, uninstalled plugins in SQL? Have, have you written plugins? Ah, cool. Have you used query rewrite plugins? Still some hands. And have you written any re query reader plugins? That's one <laughs> hand. <laughs> yeah, um, first um, I'll, I'll tell you about the philosophy behind the, the query rewrite uh, APIs. Um, and, um, it's when we started out, we, we thought, how do we do this with query rewrites? Uh, we want it to be as simple as possible to the user because. Inside the server, there are so many rewrites going on anyway. We have, for example, password obfuscation, and then, then you have to keep track of the rewritten version of a query goes to that log, and the original query goes to that log, and it all depends on the SQL mode and everything. So we wanted to keep queries simple. Like once a query is rewritten, you throw away the old one, the rewritten queries, the query. So it should be something like this. Um, somebody sitting in the middle, rewriting your query, uh, capturing it on the way to the server, and the client gets notified that, hey, I rewrote your query, and now it's something else. But the server doesn't really see what the original query was in the first place. So we actually talk about implementing it this way, um, more or less like some kind of proxy sitting in between the server, um, possibly on a different machine even. But then we realized that that would be kind of too complex, so. Um, that we decided to do it inside the server. Uh, because if you do it inside the server, you can also rewrite the query uh, after you parsed it. So that's why we have two APIs. We have the, the pre-parse and the post-parse API. Um, so, um, The benefit of uh, the pre-parse API is, of course, the low overhead. Um, the downside is that you don't have any structure. Uh, so it just takes a string and returns a string. Um, so the post-parse API operates on parse tree instead. And that's good because you can you know you know the structure of the query and you can find the strings inside it. So you won't get, if searching for a certain string comes, you will not find it inside a comment because comments are washed away by the time you parsed, which is very good. And uh, the downside is that you can't edit the parse tree destructively, so you have to build a new string and then reparse that string. Um, and you also need to re traverse the parse tree, which can potentially be a uh, performance bottleneck. Because uh, you have to remember that these, these rewrites are run on every query, and that, that can be that can slow down your system. So, and, uh, and with that, i tell you a bit about the APIs that we have. Um, here's a schematic of it, uh, the query rewrite API. First, the query comes in from something I call the network, whatever that is. What, what I mean is where, where the queries come in one by one to be parsed uh, from some kind of client. So the pre API captures the query, a 
flip state and calls out the plugins. And the post parse API works on the parse tree, which is commonly known as a list structure. So it calls out the plugins, gets the query back, and plugs it back in. So also I'd like to take a moment and show you what they actually look like in practice. Uh, here I'm using the example plugin, which is, uh, comes with the MySQL distribution. So if you're, if you're compiling from source, you need to set the plugin to a flag point to where your, uh, your plugin is located. Um, and this one just rewrites where it's lowercase. So it's, it's only for illustration. And so here I run a query. As you can see, every character in the query is rewritten to lowercase. It doesn't care if it's constant or not. Uh, there's also kind of strange thing here. You notice that you get two nodes if the query is rewritten. Uh, because what happens is that, that the show warnings command itself is being rewritten. And that happens before parsing. So this error is queued up before parsing. So that means by the time you execute the show command, you get actually two warnings, which is a bit confusing. Um, the APIs are tiered. Uh, so you have the server at the bottom. And uh, as Veta said, you have the, the audit API. And the query rewrite API builds on top of the audit API, and then we have the specific rewrite APIs on top of that. So the general API is where this node is uh, produced that says that your query, query was written. And uh, the pre parse and post parse API, these APIs are, are the ones that call out to the plugins. Um, and now I'll explain to you, um, what Sveta didn't have time to explain, uh, why, why this is so interconnected with the audit API. Uh, here is the definition of auditing from, from Wikipedia. Um, so what the audit API does, it lets, lets you use pluggable auditing. Um, and it's essentially a type of logging that you use to detect illegal activities in the database afterwards. There are certain laws that depends on this. And certain regulations. Uh, some also require that you log who sees certain data. Um, some require logging a modification of data. That could be anti-corruption laws or business laws or, or personal privacy laws. So that's what this is used for. But it also provides a very handy infrastructure for uh, uh, locking the plugins. It's important to lock an audit plugin because so that you can't uninstall it while you are auditing while you're writing to the audit log. Um, uh, in order to make that scale to, to a thousand of parts of them per second, uh, we need some, to do some clever caching here. And uh, the audit API is really efficient at that. It actually gathers uh, audit plugins um, um, based on the event that they are listening to. So certain audits Plugins will listen to login events, some will listen to, to query events, some will listen, listen to GDL events. So this way we can have them all queued up, and once an event comes, we already have a queue of all the plugins, we can just call them straight away. Uh, that does wonders for performance. So we discovered after a while that the uh, query really fit in really nicely into this. We just make another event out of the parsing, and then we can get all these all this infrastructure for free. Um, and the audit API also provides uh, parameter parsing to the plugins. Um, it's, it's based on, on void pointers and, and bitmaps, so it's a little crude, but um, that way you know that it works on all platforms. Um, and with that, I'll go into um, explaining how you declare plugins. Um, does it look familiar? I guess to those who saw Sveta's presentation, this is uh, exactly the same. Um, the, the convention for, this is a specific plugin descriptor, um, which 
describe how you will uh, handle the, the actual re rewrite event. So the convention here is that you use the version of the plugin type, and this is, in this case it's audit, so it's MySQL audit and trace version. Um, you can use a release THT function, which is used when when the plugin is dissociated from the, the session context. This typically, in practice, this is, this typically happens in the sort of session. Um, you have the event notify function, which will handle an event, and you subscribe two events by using the class masks. Um, I really don't have to say that much because it's already been covered. So I can I can skip this slide and the next slide is uh, pretty much the same. Uh, this is good. So this might just leave uh, room for questions in the end. So I'll skip to um, how to write your plugins. Um, my example that I'm using is um, the, the plugin that we like to query to lowercase. So, um, in, in my experience, you always want to include my global update. I don't know if, if Sweater managed to get, a, get by without doing it, but uh, in my experience, uh, you'll run all, into all sorts of trouble if you don't. And then you spend several hours searching for strange bugs, and then you ask some guru and he tells you, well, you, you need to include my global age first. So, my advice is you do that. Uh, then you can delete it later if you don't need to. Um, you have the plugin init function where you can set up uh, your plugin, allocate memory if you need. If, if, you, have, if you don't return zero, the, the install plugin command will fail. And uh, there's the rewrite function. It's, uh, hasn't changed since last time. And um, here you can look at the event event class, and it can be either pre-parse or post-parse. Um, so this is just for this example that we have a plugin that actually handles both pre- and post-parse plugins. In, in practice, you probably will not want to write a plugin that rewrites both before and after parsing. Uh, but that's always a good example. When we're done, we're trying to say for success. And so now I'd like to get into this piece here, where we do the pre part and rewrite. Um, so this is simplistic. Um, we we uh, allocate a new string, the same length as the old one. room for no character. Uh, we just loop, loop through it, copy everything, and change it to low, lower. Um, we point the event to the written query, and we set the length. And we have to set this flag uh, as well, or else the, the rewritten query is just going to get ignored, thrown away. Um, if you look carefully here, you can see that I use my malloc, uh, which is the alloc service we're going to tell you about. <laughs> in a few slides. Uh, it's using a performance schema key. Um, so keep that in mind for a few slides. Now I'll tell you a bit about uh, the plugin services. Um, this is something I, I thought I wouldn't have time to tell you about, but uh, Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. I can, I can make slow start stop this one. Um, I think I, I would. I, I originally planned to tell you about how to write post parse plugin, but I think I will ignore that. Uh, unless you don't have any questions, in that case, I might leave. So, what is a plugin service? Um, plugins can publish very much on their own without some help from the server. Uh, especially post parse plugins, because they only have an opaque pointer to to the THD object, and uh, opaque is just a fancy word for a void pointer, so you can't do anything with it. Uh, so the in 
filing services the flow goes like this. Uh, the audit API calls out to the filings. Uh, filings uh, do some execution, and uh, while they're doing that, they might call up some some functionality from the server. And functionality from the server offered to plugins is what we call service. And ideally, a plugin should not use any other functionality from the server unless it's defined as a service. So I, a plugin that includes uh, includes header files that are internal to the server uh, is uh, what's usually called a dirty plugin uh, because you're relying on code that you don't know if it will stay that way and you don't have any version control over it. So it might work in one version, it might crash and burn in the next. So don't do that. Um, first of all, we have the parser service. Um, uh, it lets you parse a string. Um, uh, you want to do this uh, in a post parse query rewrite after your um, post parse is complete. Um, uh, of course, if you write a post parse plugin, you already have the parse reset up by the time you call. You don't need to do the error for them. Um, you can get a normal normalized query, uh, um, which is an kind of anonymized uh, query where all the literals in the query are anonymized. And you have query digest, which, which is uh, an MD5 of that. Um, now there's, there's only one post parse query reader plugin I know of, and it's the one I wrote, uh, the one that we released. Um, but what it does, it uses these normalized queries and the query digests so it can pattern match with queries that you rewrite and, and it can do looked up in a hash table to see like, okay, this pattern on the query gets rewritten for that. And um, that we really got really good performance with that. We got a, a few percent overhead, uh, which is acceptable under the circumstances. Um, so I, I can't cover that. Uh, the, rewrite the plugin in, uh, in this short time. It wouldn't require a session on itself. And also, uh, covering the parser service exhaustively would, would be a session itself as well. So I'll just show you uh, a little bit what the code looks like here. Um, this is from service parser.h. So what you can do is you can parse a string. Um, you can get the normalized query. Uh, you can get a digest, and uh, what you can do is traverse the tree using a, a callback function, um, just a C function pointer to, to a visitor function. Um, and of course, uh, for, for an, an uh, item or an, uh, a literal in the query, you can print it. So that's really all I have time to say about uh, the parser service right now. Uh, we also have the alloc service, and it lets you well, allocate memory. That's that's all it does, and it's really good at that. Um, so I guess some of you wonder why would you want to use the server to allocate memory? Why can't you just use malloc and free yourself? Um, there's a good reason. Uh, one reason is that uh, you can use a performance schema implementation as I told you to keep in mind a few slides back. Uh, and that way it, it's very good because you can get the, you can get the, the timing and the mutex weights together with all the other mutex weights in the server inside performance schema, um, which, which is very handy. And uh, the server will also clean up the memory automatically for you. So, and um, I guess my time is up. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I guess I have time for one question, or two short ones. I'm sorry? What other plugins can you think of? What other possibilities? Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's a kind of limited um, API because it was, uh, we only had one use case for the API. So we implemented exactly what that API uses. Uh, what you could do is you could uh, loop through the query and um, you can find the literals 
in the query. And if you're a little hackish, a little more hackish than uh, I, I am allowed to recommend you to be, you can, you can go in and actually change the strings. So you can actually switch around literals, like switch places, for example. If, if you have select 1,2, you can turn that around to select 2,1. Yeah? No, you can't, because you have to successfully parse it in order to do a post parse rewrite. So that's the problem. Huh? Do I have one more? Can you just explain the case in Google rewriting? That, that's, that's where you have to go back to the philosophy with a monkey picture. Where it's like, imagine that somebody rewrote the query before it came to the server. So it, it should look like you, you, somebody took the query and, and the old server saw was the new query and the old one is gone. So, so yeah, that was really one of those tricky cases where we really had to, to decide how, how, we want to, to, how we want the philosophy to be. I guess my time's up. Yes. Thank you.